please welcome Marco Ben Kuhn. Thanks, Michael. Hi, Ron. I'm Marco. I work at Shift Crypto. We're based out, of, based out of Switzerland, and we're producing hardware wallets called the Bitbox. Uh, today, I want to talk about security issues in crypto software wallets, and more so, more so from the perspective of software devs that want to write a wallet or maybe want to integrate with wallets. Uh, more so than this, than you know, from a user perspective, where I'm sure you all already know how to secure your cryptocurrencies. Um, I also am going to mention a couple of issues that are probably obvious to many of you, but still, I want to. I don't want to talk about the standard stuff like which data type do you use to represent Satoshi or so, and so on. I want to talk about uh, stuff that I see in current software wallets that are not addressed properly. I want to kick this off with a small history lesson. So there, a couple of years back there was an issue in an Android wallet and a couple of guys posted on Bitcoin Talk with the same issue. They had an address, they sent some coins to it and immediately the coins were stolen. And a uh, very suspicious thing, the address has had previous activity before they made it. So it's a classic, so the guy already suspected correctly, suspected correctly that it's about a you know, bad random number generator and it was completely right. So I wanna go in and dissect the bug in detail. Uh, roughly 235 people have been affected, 45 Bitcoin lost by this bug. All right, so this is the function that they used to create the secret key that is used to create the public key that is used to create the receiving address, right? So fairly standard stuff. There's a secure random class from Java. They replace the standard provider with their own that um, streams data from slash dev slash u random. And then there's this extra seed that they mix in. And here the set seed looks like it would replace the original seed, but it doesn't. They made sure to overwrite the function and actually mix the entropy. So everything looks good. So what is this extra seed, we wonder? So this is the function that is called to set the extra seed. It's called seed from random org. And it's the random org generator that they implemented. And this streams random data from random.org, a uh, public service to give you random data. So you might think, okay, that's a little strange. Do I really trust some sites to give me random data? Probably not, but in the end, if you actually properly mix it with XORing, then you know everything should be all right. You can, in the worst case, just have the same entropy as before, but you know, more doesn't hurt really. Okay. Um, also, small race condition I can spot here. There's a thread running to set the extra seed, but here the seed is set at some other point in time. You know, who knows if the seed is actually fetched in time, like the extra seed. So let's look at the code that gets the random data from that URL. So I want to go through this like code review style, like if you were in a company and I review a pull request. So I start at the top and I see. HTTP, okay, that sounds out, out a little bit, right? Why isn't it HTTPS? You know, there could be a man in the middle, et cetera, et cetera, right? So then, you know, connection is made, get request, I'll find some connection timeouts, and then there's this line which says that if random.org would, would respond with a, you know, redirect response, then this should be ignored and we should just get the data from there. At the, at least I would just question the offer if you know there must be a reason he put it there, maybe he thought it was secure in some way, maybe if you check the result or something, but I don't see any of this here. And in fact, random.org did do a redirect to the HTTPS version. They started enforcing that, and this is the response that they gave. So because the redirect, redirect error was, uh, the redirect code was ignored, this is what they got. And then, also suspicious, you know, in the end, you would hope to check for a 200 okay response, or if not that, you would maybe, if you get data from a untrusted source, you would check that the output is what you think it is. For example, we have the length up there, and it's the length here, but we don't actually check if the output is the correct length. So what happens is, in the end, bad luck, the random data from nano.org is just those bytes. More than 32, but it doesn't matter. So constant. 
But going back to the set seed, you know, you think, okay, well, so that data didn't help, but it also didn't hurt because set seed, as I said before, is storing the data, so all is cool, right? What's the worst that could happen? Well, this is the function they use to set the uh, provider that, like their own implementation to override the standard implementation of secure random. And you can see it, you know, gets the data from your the slash def slash your random, all is good, and it's set up here. But if the file does not exist, then you random is set to null and there is no exception thrown. So th the implementation falls back to the standard one from Android. And that one doesn't sort the data, it just overrides it. So there you have it. So the public key that they generated randomly ended up being a constant from random.org. It doesn't help that the um, random secure provider by Android in some versions also has severe bugs where the entropy is not 128 bits but just 31 because they just zero some bug bits. And you know what are the takeaways from this? Mm, you know we all get it, you're a startup, you have um, you know, market, uh, products to market and the opportunity cost to write unit tests is high and to do lots of core reviews is high. And I think it's forgivable if you don't have full coverage on like in areas where bugs are at most an annoyance, but if it touches your balance or your crypto keys or crypto in general, like if you should have reviews and functional tests and I think at least one review would have caught at least one of the five issues before which would have prevented this outcome. Uh, the other takeaway is if you fail, fail loudly, for example, if dash um, dev dash u random is not available, you should just abort an exception and not think you can rely on something else. And the third and the most difficult part is to test your assumptions. Like in this part, I assume that the, uh, um, the random source is available on all platforms, but it turned out not to be the case. And uh, it's a hard part because oftentimes you really don't know what your assumptions are. Like it, for me, it helps to just take a step back and consciously figure out what am I assuming if I write this code. Like recently I had to port over some users from BitPay wallet service to our wallet and I assumed their gap limit was 20. In fact, it was unlimited for all versions. So, you know, it's, it's easy to just assume stuff even if you check the code, but it's, it's good to double check those things. Right. Next, I want to do a quick note on address replacing malware. Of course, we all know them. There's malware out there that, you know, hijacks your clipboard and replaces your receiving addresses, or there's browser extensions or Tor proxies that do the same. And one funny instance of that was when the ransomware locker instructed their victims to pay their ransom to them via a Tor proxy, and the Tor proxy decided in turn to replace the address. So the Tor proxy was stealing from both the victims and the ransomware offer, and they complained about that. Well. It's like, I heard. <laughs> and there's a couple of um, ways you could deal with this and we are not there yet. I think in the end we will have a world where people are not copy pasting addresses of course. And there are various avenues to deal with this. One I'm interested in personally is um, in a kind of a standard where hardware wallets can be plugged in into any service and you can just transmit uh, your keys in a secure way without any copy pasting. So um, one area that also interests me is memory errors. I've looked at various wallet implementations and I don't see many actually giving this the proper attention that it deserves. Um, you know, bit flips coming from Cosmic Race, et cetera, are way too improbable to actually hit your private key or whatever, but you know, old memory units that start to fail or degrade in bad ways, they can actually make your life bad. Um, where does this manifest? If you generate the public key, you know, you multiply your private key by the generator, then you have a public key. If you have a bit flip or an, an error in the memory there, then send funds to it, it's lost. Or what if you derive um, public keys from an XPUB? Also, if you don't double check the result, you could actually have a mistake in the hashing that is involved and also get an error. Um, also backups, of course, if you make a backup, you should check that it produces the right private keys. 
and well, this is um, Bitcoin Core implementation. It generates a public key and it immediately checks that the public key is valid by signing something. I think they could probably go a step further and also check it before making use of it. Um, yeah, if you have any hashing involved, like keyword, key, um, password stretching derivations, then it doesn't hurt to do it twice in different memory locations just to reduce the likelihood. And then um, most wallet software also just keeps the data in memory without any checksums or error correcting codes, which could be an issue. Um, yeah, um, you actually if you store a public key, you're better off just storing the address instead if the only thing we're gonna do is receive money on it. Except you're in Ethereum land where you know checksums are for buses. So. Uh, next topic is pretty trivial and I'm kind of embarrassed to even speak about it, but I feel I have to because I've seen so many local web servers running without any authentication. And you might be, you know, a guy that wants to someday try to make a local web service to access Bitcoin, RPC, or Lightning, clients, whatever, and you think because you're local, it doesn't matter because I'm the only user, I connect to it, no one else, so I don't need any authentication. But, you know, most people are not aware that browsers can access localhost. And I, just, I don't mean like localhost, if you type in localhost in the URL, I mean every website can do this. Oh, hi. small exchange here, one guy. Also, like I was in his shoes a couple of years ago, I thought this was ridiculous, but and I, to be honest, I'm unsure why browsers even allow this. Anyway, case in point, uh, there was an issue in Electrum last year. And Electrum, as you may know, is the, like one of the most used and widely popular wallets, and they also enable the JSON RPC over HTTP by default. And it had no password protection, so every website that you go to could, in fact, steal your privacy at least and your coins at best. Or the other way. Um, not only websites can do this, also like if you're a shared web server or if you have users on your machine or maybe you know, you have a local Apache running and there's an, a guy that can hack in and escalate privileges to the user, www-user, then they can of course just scan the local ports and access your server, even if it's in a different user. Yeah, not there, that was the point. Uh, of course, without saying, if you have authentication, you should also use SSL, otherwise people can, sh can just sniff your authentication and I think I have to check, but I think I need to file an issue also with Electrum. They still don't have SSL there. It's kind of scary, so. Phishing. Phishing is one of the worst problems in the World Wide Web because it can be arbitrarily sophisticated. Like there's no real way to just eliminate the threat of it. It's just a red race. Uh, you could go to, of course, you know, classics, malicious wallet, download a malicious wallet, go to a malicious web wallet. A uh, guy from the Monero community, the Hiho guy, made a nice instructional post, so this wasn't real, but it was showing how you can buy a VPS and do some adverts and make a fake URL, like with a small Unicode O, very subtle, so no one will see this, to scam people into going to my Monero and giving up their private keys. And, you know, there is something you can do about this, which is use hardware, especially U2F and hardware wallets. They go a very, very long way in solving the, a lot of the problems. Of course, it's not fail safe, but it helps a lot. Like Google mentioned, they hadn't had a single phishing attempt, a successful phishing attempt since they introduced or required U2F. Right. Um, even more than using U2F and hardware wallets, which help you because you know you don't give up your private keys, you actually have to confirm manually on your device that you're giving up your, your coins. The hardware wallets can help you if they implement something like whitelist. So this is an excerpt from the Bitbox firmware. Like a couple of web wallets are just whitelisted and if you connect anywhere else, it just doesn't work. And a couple of our users send us thank you notes because they went on myforwallets.com or whatever and they couldn't connect and they were happy that nothing worse happened. Um, I'm toying with an idea, it's like early stage, I don't know, but like in the web you can eliminate 
phishing attempts this way because the browser makes sure that the URL is encoded in the U2F protocol, but what if you download a native app, which in many ways is more secure than a web wallet, but there you're out of luck. I'm, I'm thinking maybe you could use hardware to install or launch any kind of wallet locally after making integrity checks. Also, please, like I don't see nearly enough services supporting U2F, like there's Dropbox and GitHub, etc. but I'm thinking Bitcoin exchanges, Monero exchanges. Like all of them still are stuck with Google Authenticator, which is not secure. Uh, I wanna do a brief note on the choice of the tech stack if you wanna build a web wallet or a wallet. And I don't wanna go into, you know, too many of the hot topics where people debate if this is better or not. Just wanna make a couple points here. Um, one is that if you have a web wallet in the browser, even though you might be safer from phishing attacks, a uh, browser is just the wild west of security. Like, I mean, everything goes. Especially if you have a malicious browser extension that um, subverts your phishing prevention. Like, they can just put in arbitrary data and, you know, you can, I don't know, you can ask the user to move their funds to a secure location because Trezor said so, but it's not Trezor, it's just some extension. Uh, all of those web wallets would be probably better off packaging it just in a native app. Um, of course, the most popular one is Electrum. A lot of apps run on Electrum. I'm not a big fan. It has issues because in the front end as well as in the back end, there's JavaScript, so the bridge to you know, remote code execution is very small. You just have to find a small hole and then you have access to everything. And not sandbox by default, end and end. Uh, but there's other easier ways. You can use Qt with Web Engine, or you could use the Chromium Embedded Framework. They are more secure and also just almost just as easy to actually build. Uh, you know, most people use web frontends because they are easier to build. They use less resources. You have more talent, like more access to people that can use it. Uh, but of course, if you have the resources, you know, skip the web part altogether and do native, like Monero GUI is a great example. Um, yeah, quick note on programming languages. As I said before, if you use JavaScript in the front end and back end, you might have some issues. If you use C++, you have like a lot of memory issues. We're really hard to get rid of, even if you are very careful. And um, people tend to gravitate towards those two languages because they run everywhere. Like JavaScript runs on Android, runs on iOS, C++ as well, and you know, practically every wallet is one of those two languages nowadays. And I just want to make the point that um, since Maybe last year, um, Go and Rust and other languages that compile to C are a very viable alternative, and you can use them effectively to make a full application on Android, iOS, Mac, Windows, Linux, server. And you know, you don't have any remote execution. Well, no buffer overflows, no smash protection that you have to put in place. And, and, and. Uh, privacy. It's not only about security. If you leak your privacy, you're also not secure. I don't want to go too much into why privacy matters. I want to just refer you to this great guy, Glenn Greenwald, and check out this YouTube video. It's amazing. Um, today's wallet leak your privacy. For example, before blockchain.info's Android wallet, if you go to random.org, then they know and their provider knows and their hosting center knows that you're using this Android wallet, which is not great. Um, you know, if you use Electrum servers, if you use my Monero, any web wallet, Trezor, if they connect to a server, you're leaking privacy. Maybe not to the same level, but you are. Uh, we can educate users about VPN and Tor and integrate it into the wallet and make it a one-click experience, but I think this is still probably not feasible or too hard. I want to you know, encourage every wallet offer to, be, to, enable, um, to enable the user to connect their own full node. And our wallet that we just recently released for the Bitbox does that from the start. Like I think that's very important. But more so, I want to um, dream about a world where everyone has a plug and play node that they can install next to the router and it just does everything in a very simple manner. And with a bit of luck, we can reach that goal. Like at Shift, we've been toying a little bit with the idea. Like an intern made some knocks and we are toying with the idea how how or if this would be a good, you know, good future. I do think this would be amazing. 
So where does this leave us with Monero? Um, you have noticed that my talk has been focused mostly on Bitcoin and stuff like that, other coins. Um, in Monero, the current state is that they are, Monero is a little bit behind Bitcoin, maybe a couple of years in terms of the wallet experience. There is Monero GUI and Monero um, client. There is mymonero.com, and that's basically it as of, as of today. And my Monero makes no like effort to be secure. It's by chat, by it's deliberate. They have a really nice disclaimer that it's not secure, so that's okay. Um, the Monero GUI is awesome. It is a full node. It runs. Everything is good. But of course, users will want to have light clients eventually because running your node is very difficult, as in Monero especially. So, um, so I expect in the next couple of years to see a lot more like wallets being implemented for Monero on various platforms, and then maybe you can take away some of the notes I made today. Thank you. That was my talk. Which implications? So institutions have different um, requirements than end users mostly. And as of today, there is no good solutions for institutions to start doing real business on top of crypto. But a lot of companies are in this space like trying to make those solutions. Yeah, um, if you're going to have a hard time as an institution if you want to just pull together some of the existing clients and hardware wallets and do something on your own, it works most. Like, Banks and institutions are doing it today to crazy amounts of money, but I wouldn't recommend it, and solutions are being rolled out as we speak. Thank you. I haven't thought about it a lot. I don't think, well, intuitively speaking, I don't think verifiable remote hardware works. I might be wrong. Um, although it still might be a reasonable solution. Like, there's never, a, you know, you're secure or insecure. There's levels. And if you can have a remote hardware which you can trust in some ways, but not fully, then that's good. And it's a step in the right direction. Still, in the end, I think it's best if you can have your own node at home. Um, also, like your own node, if you buy it from a company like us, then how do you trust that? Like the goal is, of course, also to have an um, instruction to build it yourself with off-the-shelf, very cheap hardware and all that stuff. Yeah. I didn't quite get it. Come again. Are talking about Monero? Is the first choice for what? Sorry. So uh, uh, I, I was asking that uh, this coin is maybe for because of privacy. Uh, it's kind of first choice for uh, the actors behind like exploit kids. They uh, drop the crime waves and uh, uh, any uh, crime wave that you know involve crypto miners, uh, they usually. Uh, uh, drop for, for, for Monero. I didn't, still didn't get the part about Monero. I think you're asking if about malicious activity on Monero and privacy, right? So I just want to refer you to this, this one over here. I urge you to watch it. Like this mirrors my, my view on privacy. 
Thank you.